Good afternoon and good morning and welcome to this GOPAC and UN Pacific Regional Anti-Corruption Project uh, supported webinar on the role for Pacific parliamentarians in the UN General Assembly Special Session Against Corruption, the UNGAS in 2021. We're delighted to have a number of GOPAC members and parliamentarians from the Pacific region and beyond, and also our partners at UNPRAC in UNDP and UNODC. I'd now like to uh, share with you uh, some opening remarks from the global chair of GOPAC, the Global Organization of Parliamentarians Against Corruption, His Excellency Ahmed bin Abdullah bin Zayed Al Mahmoud, who's the chair of GOPAC and also the speaker of the Qatar Shura Council, the Qatar Parliament. Thank you. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Chairman and Members of Parliaments of the Oceania region, may Allah's peace and mercy be upon you. On the occasion of the Convention of the Regional Symposium of the Global Organization of Parliamentarians Against Corruption, Go Back Oceania, organized by the Global Organization of Parliamentarians, against corruption go back in cooperation with the regional chapter of the UN Pacific Anti-Corruption Project. I am pleased to address this opening session and th to thank you all for your appreciated efforts to fight corruption and combat all its negative repercussions on sustainable development on the region and the world over. The topics on your agenda are very important and call on us to be well prepared for the upcoming requirements, particularly the preparation for the UN General Assembly Special Session against corruption, which we hope our organization will have an active role in organizing and participating in its work, in its works, as well as in holding sideline meeting of parliamentarians of parliamentarians to compute to contribute to it brother and sister i have prepared an intervention on the agenda of the webinar to save time and effort our dear friend mr john hyde the secretary of go back will distribute copies of the intervention to you and incorporate the same fully in the minutes of this webinar. I reiterate my gratitude and appreciation to you for your all efforts and initiatives geared to fight corruption and support our global organization of parliamentarians against corruption, go back. I wish you luck and success so that this seminar attains its objectives. May Allah's peace and mercy be upon you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair uh, Al Mahmoud in uh, Qatar, the Shura Council there. I'd now like to introduce the chair of GOPAC Oceania, who is a member of parliament in Tonga. Lord Fusatua has been the chair of GOPAC Tonga since its inception uh, five years ago. And in the parliament in Tonga, they have an official standing committee on anti-corruption, which has a role in oversight of integrity agencies and also enshrined in their standing orders is recognition of the role of the GOPAC committee 
which has the same membership as the standing committee and the GOPAC committee has a role in oversight of the code of conduct of the parliamentarians in Tonga. So I'm now delighted to introduce the chair of GOPAC Oceania, Lord Fusatua. Excellencies, representatives of member states, civil society and other stakeholders, I'm honoured to provide the opening marks on behalf of the Global Organisation of Parliamentarians, GOPAC, as chairman of GOPAC Oceania. As you know, we in GOPAC are a worldwide alliance of legislators who have come together to combat corruption and strengthen public institutions and uphold the rule of law. Our members come from different cultures, speak different languages, pursue different, uh, profess different faiths and pursue different political philosophies and indeed have even been on opposite sides of history and warfare. But we are united by the common conviction that corruption is now the single greatest threat to the development of societies, to the security of nations and to the rights of all mankind. To quote uh, an, an analysis by a good uh, colleague of mine, to put everything in context, more than $1 trillion in bribes are paid out every year, according to the World Bank. More than $2.1 trillion are siphoned away by illicit financial flows, according to the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. More than $3.1 trillion are siphoned away by tax evasion, according to the Tax Justice Network. These three metrics alone amount to $6.2 trillion. By contrast, what began as the Millennium Project and developed into the Sustainable Development Goals, posits the amount required to satisfy all of the SDGs at 480 billion. What the world loses to corruption each year is enough to fulfill the SDGs more than a dozen times over. To end the worst forms of human misery and poverty more than a dozen times over. A world of corruption is stealing what is in our grasp and ends of poverty and all forms of human suffering. Ending corruption is seductively easy to describe, but fiendishly hard to implement. It takes a coalition of committed parliamentarians and vigilant citizens as the watchdogs of democracy. And it is a tragedy that most citizens view our anti-corruption institutions as having been muzzled their bite and muted their bark by the very institutions they are meant to oversee. Cynical citizens having lost faith in the public institutional process must work together to hold public officials to account, while parliamentarians must harness the goodwill of citizens to participate in this anti-corruption process. Therefore, our goals seem to be threefold. Firstly, enforcing integrity amongst public officials. Secondly, establishing and entrenching transparency in public institutions. And finally, ending impunity to bring the worst offenders to justice. In respect of transnational crime in the form of transnational movement of narcotics and financial flows, as per the graphics, I will supply to John and he will forward on to you. From the UNODC World Drug Report in 2019, they show that the Pacific, including Tonga, Fiji, Samoa, and especially Australia, are transit points for both narcotics and cash, incoming eastbound 
as contraband from Southeast Asia en route to both continental North and South America, and in return routes westbound from Colombia and the main cocaine factories of South America, transiting through the Pacific, taking the drugs and the cash en route, both back up the west coast of the United States, up through Japan, Thailand, Indonesia, Southeast Asia, and into mainland China. The Fiji National Narcotics Strategy Draft, which contains graphics, which I'll give to John to forward you, show evidence of seizing by authorities in detail. The market traje trajectory shows an increase from 25,000 kilograms in the year 2000 to 250,000 i.e. 25 metric tonnes in the year 2017. As with all social movements throughout history, and be in no doubt, this is a social movement. This will require a concerted effort by concerned citizens, coupled with the work of parliamentarians who are focused on regaining integrity in the public governmental and parliamentary institutions. As you will have seen in the web webinar materials, the UN General Assembly has adopted Resolution 73-191 to convene a special session of the UN General Assembly against corruption, or UNGAS, with the co Conference of State Parties, COSP, to lead the preparatory process with a special session in the UN Office on Drugs and Crime to provide substantive expertise and technical support. This special session from the 2nd to the 4th of June this year will discuss challenges and measures to prevent and combat corruption and strengthen international cooperation. We look forward to strengthening and entrenching the great cooperation contained in the Te Niwo vision, which calls on Pacific countries to recognise the importance of political will and leadership at all levels in addressing corruption. It also calls on all Pacific leaders to champion integrity and advocate and implement anti-corruption practices in their parliaments, public services, private sectors and entire communities. Teyanawa vision further states, and we support this completely, that we commit to promoting the Blue Pacific as a recognised distinct region within the international framework, including the Conference of State Parties to UNCAC, to support the drive for a united regional anti-corruption voice, and we in GOPAC support a strong Pacific engagement with the UN General Assembly's special session on corruption and its implementation. I bid you all a very productive uh, and enjoyable meeting. Thank you. Hello. Well done. How was it? Thank you very much, Lord Fusatua. Uh, um, I'd like to welcome a number of uh, guests today. We, um, as well as our speakers, uh, such as GOPAC Australia Chair Margaret Quirk, uh, we've got the New Zealand GOPAC Chair, Louisa Wall, who I believe is joining us from an airport. And also in the, from the Victorian government, Minister Jill Hennessy. And we really appreciate you taking time out. Uh, Hugh McDermott, also from the New South Wales Parliament. And uh, from GOPAC Indonesia, Ibu Desi Pramita as well. I'd now like to... Uh, introduce a very special friend of GOPAC, uh, Dr. Sonia Stefanovska Trajanovska, who's the regional UNDP anti-corruption advisor for UNPRAC. And GOPAC Oceania has been very fortunate to have had a close relationship since 2013 with uh, both UNDP and UNODC in the Pacific through their uh, UN Pacific Regional Anti-Corruption Project. And it's seen us been involved in inductions for most of the parliaments in the Pacific 
and the establishment of GOPAC chapters in six Pacific nations so far. So now I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Sonia uh, to share her views on the importance of uh, UNGAS and parliamentarians for those of us in the Pacific. Dr. Sonia. Thank you very much, um, uh, John. Um, dear Mr. Chair of uh, GOPAC, uh, dear Chair of GOPAC Oceania, and also distinguished uh, chairs of other chapters of uh, GOPAC, uh, dear colleagues, uh, dear participants, uh, it is a great uh, honor for me to be part of this um, webinar framed around the United Nations uh, General Assembly Special Session Against Corruption, ANGAS 2021, jointly organized by GOPAC and uh, us at, uh, at ANPRAC, the United Nations Pacific Regional Anti-Corruption Project. It's a flagship uh, project implemented jointly by UNODC and UNDP in 14 Pacific uh, countries since uh, 2012. And I'm sure most of you are familiar with um, who we are and um, um, what we, we do. Um, the partnership um, uh, between GOPAC and ANPRAC is very natural to me because it is firmly grounded on our shared strategic goals and vision and that is to combat corruption, strengthen democracy, and promote the rule of law. As we know well, it is not by accident that parliaments are important stakeholders in the fight against corruption, with their constitutional mandates to both oversee government and to hold government, governments to account. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, of course, Audit institutions, ombudsman offices, and anti-corruption agencies report to parliaments as a means of ensuring both their independence from government and reinforcing parliament's position at the apex of accountability institutions. At the same time, parliaments also play a key role in promoting accountability through constituency outreach, public hearings, and parliamentary commissions. In other words, words, parliaments play a critical role in enacting strong governance frameworks and undertaking oversight of executive power. It is in recognition of these critical functions and roles of parliaments that we have been working together with GOPAC on a number of initiatives, as mentioned by John as well, to improve the role and influence of parliaments in the national and regional anti-corruption reforms in the Pacific. One specific area of cooperation has been the joint advocacy around the preparation and adoption of a very important milestone anti-corruption document for the Pacific, which was mentioned, the Teyaniva vision, which is aligned with the national and regional commitments for implementation under the United Nations Convention Against Corruption, ANCAC, and also the SDG 16 on peace, justice, and strong institutions. Let me just remind you on this occasion uh, that the Pacific members of parliament and members of the GOPAC Oceania specifically um, expressed clear support to the Pacific um, Regional Anti-Corruption Conference, which was hosted by the government of Kiribati in February 2020 and also to signpost the need for parliamentarians' engagement in implementation follow-ups. This also inspired us at ANPRAC to prepare an information note for the Kiribati Conference, which was entitled Action Taken by Pacific Legislatures to Address Corruption. In fact, the Teyaniva vision was symbolically adopted in a parliament building, the beautiful parliament building of Kiribati shaped like a boat, which warmly hosted the Pacific leaders and representatives during the region's first ever Pacific leaders regional anti-corruption conference and which was also ho hosted by the president of um, Kiribati himself. I wish to therefore uh, take this opportunity to extend our gratitude to the Kiribati uh, hosts um, of the uh, last year's conference but also specifically to mention and to thank GOPAC for all their advocacy 
uh, in the preparatory finalization and follow-up processes to the Kiribati conference of last year. After the uh, conference uh, last year, the vision was recognized by the Pacific Island Forum State's economic ministers in their 2020 statement and was also adopted by the Pacific leaders at the meeting of the Pacific Island uh, Forum Secretariat. Recently, it was in February this year. Angus 2021 will be another milestone opportunity for following up on these commitments and for voicing the Pacific unity against corruption and for getting international attention and recognition of the Pacific anti-corruption efforts. In other words, Angus 2021 will be an excellent platform for the Pacific to demonstrate the sustained and even more consolidated anti-corruption commitments and all the efforts that have been done in between in preparation of the um, uh, uh, vision, the Niava vision in the follow-up, but also as a long-term uh, vision, uh, 2030 and even 2050 uh, vision. It will also be an opportunity to propose bold actions for championing integrity, advocating for and implementing anti-corruption reforms and good practices ac across parliaments, public sector, private sector, and entire communities in the Pacific. I wish to sincerely thank and commend GOPAC for ensuring a strong Pacific engagement with the UN General Assembly Special Session Against Corruption due to take place in June this year. Finally, let me reiterate that in the spirit of our exceptionally valuable partnership, the team of UNPRAG, including myself, remains at disposal for further support to these efforts. I thank you and I look forward to the discussions today. Thank you. Over from me. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dr. Sonia, uh, for that presentation and for the ongoing uh, strong relationship that we have uh, with the United Nations, specifically through the UN Pacific Regional Anti-Corruption Project. Uh, I'd now like to uh, introduce our next speaker, uh, who's going to be setting the stage uh, for the involvement at the UNGAS. And uh, this is being provided to us by Francesco Cesci, who is the UN Office of Drugs and Crime, advisor on anti-corruption for Southeast Asia and the Pacific. And uh, our colleagues in uh, GOPAC Southeast Asia had a similar webinar to this a month ago uh, where Francesco uh, presented. And I'd also like to acknowledge we've been joined by the global vice chair of uh, GOPAC, uh, uh, Honourable Carlos, who is a Member of Parliament in Mexico and who's joined us at this hour as well. So now I'd like to introduce for our next presentation, Francesco Cesci, UNODC, Southeast Asia and Pacific. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure for me to speak on behalf of UNODC in this important event. I wish to thank the GOPAC for the invitation and thank all of you for participating in the discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, it is clear that parliamentarians are extremely important for the anti-corruption efforts at the national and international level. So we really value the interest and participation of GOPAC in the UN special session of the General Assembly dedicated to fighting corruption. I would like to take this opportunity to summarize the work that is being done in preparation to the special session of the General Assembly. The General Assembly decided to convene a special session in December 2018 and countries around the world are preparing for it. 
On 1st June 2020, the General Assembly adopted a so-called modalities resolution. On 31st of August, the Assembly decided to change the dates of the special session to 2nd and 4th of June 2021, while they were previously set for uh, April 2021. In the UN architecture, the conference of the state parties to the UN Convention Against Corruption is the key anti-corruption policy-making body. Accordingly, the General Assembly invited the conference to lead the preparatory process for the special session by addressing all organizational and substantive matters in an open-handed manner and requested its extended bureau to approve a work plan and timeline for the preparatory process and to appoint two co-facilitators for the informal consultations on a draft political declaration. The co-facilitators appointed by the extended bureau are His Excellency Ambassador Eric Anderson Machado of Peru and His Excellency Ambassador Hamad al kahabi of the United Arab Emirates. In line with the modalities resolution, UNODC is supporting the preparatory process substantively and technically. In preparation for the UNGAS, three intersessional meetings of the Conference of the State Parties have been held in Vienna to give room for discussion and exchange of ideas and a lively exchange between state party, international organization and civil society is has taken place and a lot of ideas for the outcome of the UNGAS have been uh, presented. These meetings usually have a thematic focus and have panel discussions on issues that are at the same time are being discussing, discussed in the informal consultations. The thematic focus areas were prevention and criminalization at the intersessional meeting in September asset recovery and international cooperation at the intersessional meeting in mid-November. And there has been a third meeting in February 2021 that covered the issues of the impact of beneficial ownership transparency and the role of the private sector in supporting anti-corruption efforts. Uh, the meeting also covered uh, uh, issues to address impunity, uh, including by strengthening the independence, transparency and integrity of oversight body and harnessing the full potential of education and technology in efforts to prevent and combat corruption. The informal outcomes reflecting the discussion at the meetings are being made available on the ungas2021.org website. The expected outcome of the General Assembly special session is a political declaration. Its zero draft was circulated among delegation on 17th of August 2020. It was prepared by the co-facilitators with our help on the basis of inputs from the state parties to the convention. A special session of the Conference of the States Party to the UNCAC will take place on 7 May 2021. At that session, the conference is expected to approve the draft political declaration and then transmit it to the General Assembly for adoption at a special session in June 2021. A call for inputs by interested stakeholders was sent last year, seeking contribution to inspire and feed into the drafting process. Many interesting ideas were submitted. They, were all, they are all available on our website, ungas2021.org. We received around 57 submissions from state parties, international organizations and CSOs, academias and uh, private sector. GOPAC submitted the two contributions on the necessity in, to include Pacific region countries and parliamentarians uh, in meaningful deliberations at the UNCAS and the second one on broader, uh, of broader nature, covering the role of parliamentarians, the importance of strong and independent anti-corruption institutions, and improved stakeholder cooperation to fight corruption. On behalf of UNODC, I would like to thank GOPAC again for uh, these uh, submissions. Additional ideas have been presented at the UNGAS international intersessional meetings. The submissions cover a range of issues 
across areas of uh, addressing corruption, starting from the international legal architecture to ideas on how to ensure that corruption can be more effectively addressed toward making progress in achieving the SDGs. Let me give you a brief overview of the topic that uh, are covered by the various submissions. A lot of submissions deal with preventive actions, such as prevention strategies and anti-corruption and oversight bodies. Uh, also on transparency and financing uh, candidatures uh, for political uh, um, parties and organizations, uh, the issue of beneficial ownership transparency, anti-corruption measures in the private sector, and access to information and effective and inclusive participation of individuals and group in anti-corruption efforts. Submissions further cover criminalization and law enforcement, a means to end impunity, such as measures related to improving capacity of law enforcement, enforcement agencies or effective cooperation and information exchange between relevant agencies. Several submissions call for a safe and enabling environment and protection measure for those involved in uncovering and enforcing corruption offences, such as whistleblowers, reporting persons, witnesses, investigators, prosecutors and investigative journalists. Many submissions dealing with international cooperation and asset recovery, which primarily seek to make these processes more efficient and less burdensome. Inter alia through the suggestions to use and strengthen legal frameworks and regional, interregional and international networks and using flexible instruments such as non-conviction based confiscation as well as simplification of procedures to improve efficiencies of uh, cooperation processes. We have also received submissions on technical assistance and information sharing as well as on cross-cutting issues such as on the use of new technologies, the linkages between corruption and gender and corruption measurements. Finally, some submissions contain innovative and forward-looking new ideas, such as how to address corruption in the responses of COVID-19 uh, uh, to the COVID-19 pandemic. There were also suggestions, suggestions for new instruments, mechanisms and institutions, such as a voluntary anti-corruption trust fund to finance technical assistance programs or a body to measure the concrete impact of anti-corruption initiatives. The UN has developed a common position, which is the UN system substantive contribution to the special session of the General Assembly. The common position was developed under the co-leadership of UNODC, the Department of Political and Peacebuilding Affairs and UNDP within the framework of the Secretary General's Executive Committee. The zero draft of the political declaration is structured along the chapters of UNCAC, which was the wish of many of the state's parties. The draft is currently being negotiated in its second reading under the able leadership of the ambassador from UAE and Peru, who co-chair the informal consultations. As for the timeline, the COSP is scheduled to approve the political declaration on the 7th of May, as I mentioned, and subsequently transmit it to the General Assembly for discussion at the uh, special session. This is, of course, an extremely important process to promote the fight against corruption worldwide. The outcome of the UNCAS 2021 could potentially chart a path that promotes innovative, flexible and forward-looking means to implement the 2030 Agenda, in particular SDG 16. We welcome contribution from the civil society and NGOs and therefore thank again to GOPAC for the interest and contribution that the organization is uh, making. So thank you very much, wishing you a successful meeting and uh, Goodbye. Thank you very much, Francesco. Uh, we're also uh, 
pleased to be uh, negotiating with uh, UNODC and the UN in New York. Uh, so as GOPAC, along with uh, UNPRAC, can host an international side event during the Young Gas between the 2nd to the 4th of uh, June in uh, New York as a, as a virtual side event. While they are intending that UNGAS will be a live meeting, COVID permitting, the side events will be held virtually. I'm now delighted to move to a very special friend of uh, GOPAC. And back when he was an ordinary member of parliament, uh, he joined the GOPAC Kiribati group uh, back in 2014, 2015, when UNPRAC and GOPAC uh, undertook uh, one of the first uh, anti-corruption projects with parliaments and the Kiribati parliament actually became the first parliament in the Pacific to establish a standing committee on anti-corruption. Uh, and that parliamentarian has now moved on to become the president of Kiribati and he hosted, as we've heard from a number of speakers, the uh, first regional anti-corruption leaders uh, conference in Kiribati last year in February and both Sonia and myself were uh, honoured to be in Kiribati. It was I think the last overseas meeting for many of us and uh, from that meeting uh, we've had uh, tremendous acceptance of the Te Aniwa vision. Uh, so I'm now like to introduce His Excellency Ti Beresens Tanesi Mamao, the President of Kiribati. Your Excellencies, Ladies and gentlemen, I begin by warmly sending greetings to you all in our usual Kiribati tradition, Kamnabaninidaudi. In February of this year, just before the COVID-19 shutdowns, Pacific leaders and stakeholders met in Kiribati for a two-day Pacific Leaders Regional Anti-Corruption Conference, the first such regional meeting ever in the Pacific where we adopted a groundbreaking DNY vision, Pacific Unity Against Corruption Outcome Statement. The conference was attended by 11 Pacific Island Forum countries, including Australia and New Zealand, plus other regional and international organizations, such as the Commonwealth, and assisted by the UN Pacific Regional Anti-Corruption, known as UN BRAC project. DNY is the Kiribati word for sale, and canoe. A sailing canoe is a common form of transport in the Pacific. It is symbolically referred to as the only traditional means to unite the blue Pacific in the fight against corruption. A sailing canoe in open waters will encourage both tranquility and stormy weather, and that is what is expected to happen in the fight against corruption. It is not easy nor short term, but it is a long journey that requires collaborative efforts of all sectors of society. At the Conference of the State Parties 8th session held from 16 to 20th December 2019 in Abu Dhabi, which I attended, the conference endorsed preparations for the special session of the General Assembly against corruption due to be held in June 2021 in New York. The importance of an inclusive preparatory process including extensive substantive consultations was clearly emphasized. As expressed in the DNY vision, our leaders and representatives have endorsed commitments that build on their national engagement with the United Nations Convention Against Corruption, UNCAC, and the Sustainable Development Goals. I sincerely hope that this statement will give guidance as specific countries look to enhance their regional frameworks to tackle corruption and also to provide a unified position in preparation for the special session of the UN General Assembly against corruption. As leaders and representatives of Pacific nations, 
We know how powerful our local actions can be as they lead to greater regional impacts. Our ocean, our fish, and our weather do not worry about national boundaries on a map, nor do transnational criminals and corruption. Every one of our countries is different. Each of our country is addressing corruption and its prevention in different ways. We do have to be wary of anyone trying to tell us that there is one magic solution to corruption applicable to us all. In the Pacific, we are using the framework of UNCAC to guide us, and its peer review modus operandi fits our Pacific way of Talanoa or Meroro in the Kiribati context. Respect, and that is respectively listening and sharing. The government is still progressing in fulfilling its obligations under the UNCAC through the creation of best preventive policies and legislations to combat corruption. In doing so, the government has developed the National Public Service Code of Conduct aiming to prevent public servants from committing corrupt misconduct. In addition, governance is now part of our national fabric as one of the pillars of the Kiribati vision for 20 years known as KV20 because to truly transform the lives of our people in a prosperous Kiribati, we need a corrupt, free society. I extend once again my sincere appreciation to my own Kiribati team and UN Prague for their preparations for this implementation review group and ongoing engagement with, with our Pacific colleagues to ensure that the special session of the General Assembly against corruption is meaningful with positive outcomes that will benefit not only our Pacific region but our individual countries, governments and the people we are here to represent. In closing, I bestow upon us all our traditional blessing of the memory which means health, the Rai, that is peace, or the Tabemo, meaning prosperity. Thank you and may God bless us all. Thank you very much, uh, President uh, Tanasi Mamao from uh, Kiribati. I'd now like to uh, move slightly to the northwest in the Pacific to Papua New Guinea uh, to introduce the Honourable Gary Jufa, who uh, is Deputy Chairman of the Public Accounts Committee in the Papua New Guinea. Uh, Parliament, but is also a governor of a province. Uh, the Public Accounts Committee in PNG uh, tabled the first of its landmark e inquiry reports into the supply, procurement and distribution of medicines in PNG and anti-corruption priorities uh, late in 2020. And this has made significant impact in Papua New Guinea and uh, has enabled them to put in place uh, a number of improvements. Uh, but as uh, uh, Honourable Gary will inform us, there's still a long way to go. I'm now delighted to hand over to Papua New Guinea GOPAC parliamentarian, Honourable Gary Jufa. Hi, my name is Gary Jufa. I'm the Governor for Oro Province and the Chairman of the Special Parliamentary Committee on Public Sector Reform, as well as the Deputy Chairman of the Public Accounts Committee. This is a brief presentation on my experience in the Public Accounts Committee during the inquiry into corruption in the National Department of Health, the government entity that is given the responsibility of managing the health sector in Papua New Guinea. Our inquiry was chaired by John Pundari, the Honourable Member for Compium Ambum, and I was his deputy. We were assisted by about five to six other members of the committee. Uh, they turned up according to their schedules and when they were available. We conducted the inquiry in the first instance by requesting information from the National Department of Health to clarify reports that we had received from the Auditor General's reports that were tabled in Parliament. The analysis of this information 
formulated certain inquiry questions and reviews and basically raised questions that needed to be asked. And these questions were asked to the department itself and other relevant persons we felt would help us in the inquiry. The inquiry basically found that there was widespread, widespread corruption within the department, especially in the procurement division of the National Department of Health. There was very weak leadership at the management level, and it appeared that there was significant negligence and impropriety committed by key persons within the organization in the purchase, supply, procurement, distribution of drugs in Papua New Guinea or throughout Papua New Guinea. Heavily inflated contracts were basically passed through. Contracts that had huge conflict of interest situations were basically passed through and endorsed. And uh, you know this brought to question the, the, the good governance mechanisms that existed within the department, which I would say don't exist. If there are any good governance mechanisms that existed in the department, they were totally ignored and they were just there for the purposes of window dressing and they achieved virtually nothing. The people of Papua New Guinea were significantly endangered by this situation in that many of the drugs were either not distributed in a timely manner, or if they were distributed, they came from sources that were dubious. In some instances, we found that some of the drugs were actually the wrong drugs or of a very poor quality, and they did not comply with international standards insofar as quality and control is concerned, and insofar as manufacturing of those said drugs is concerned. In this type of inquiry, we found that it is very important to ensure that everyone that is involved is brought before camera and presented in such a manner that they are there where they have to answer the questions that are presented to them. This may sound draconian, but I found that it is the only way to really get down to the bottom of these issues and find solutions to the problems of corruption that continue to confront Papua New Guinea, and indeed continues to confront Papua New Guinea. Corruption is uh, it's everywhere. It's like a growing cancer, and unfortunately, it will continue to grow if we don't come together to tackle corruption, if we don't make the effort to address it in an aggressive, assertive manner. Constant, continuous, consistent effort is required at all levels. It's not good enough to just recognize corruption. It's not good enough to just complain about it, write about it, post about it on social media. You have to actually get your hands dirty and confront corruption, and you have to take it out. That's just the only way to deal with corruption. That's how we deal with it, or that's how we have dealt with it in Papua New Guinea. Unfortunately, there are still, or there is still a long way to go. Uh, our report, the recommendations have barely been acted upon. However, I am very optimistic that now with the new secretary on board, he has formed a disciplinary committee. He is taking a look at the recommendations and implementing those recommendations, but we are going to follow up. As the chairman of my special parliamentary committee on public sector reform, I will follow up. As the Deputy Chairman of the Public Accounts Committee, I will follow up. What has happened to these recommendations? Where are we now? And that's what you need to do. If you're an elected official, you've got to keep following up. You've got to keep banging on doors and knocking on tables and demanding the best out of public servants. You know, But not only just the best, you've also got to ensure that the systems that are designed to work are working. And if they're broken down or if they have been circumvented, why? How? By who? How do we improve them? It's a question that you're going to need to continue to ask yourself. The Department of Health in Papua New Guinea, what we discovered was that this is a legacy issue, or there were legacy issues that were carried over from decades of poor management, and I would say ignorance by those at political levels. Uh, as a result of the ignorance at political levels, as a result of weak or poor management, corruption grew and spread like a terrible cancer. And unfortunately, we were only seeing what had already happened and had caused so much misery for mainly the most vulnerable people in our society. I hope this has been useful. If there's anything else I can do to provide further information, please do not hesitate to contact my office and I will do what I can to present such information. If I am unable to do so, I will be able to point you in the right direction so that you can get the information that you require. This will require a whole of government effort. This will require political will. This will require the, the effort of the relevant agencies that are tasked to be watchdogs for your country, for your people. 
the police, the public prosecutor, the attorney general, as well as all the other relevant agencies that, are, that play some role, they all have to work together to confront and stamp out corruption. Thank you very much and look at you behind time. Thanks very much, Honourable Gary Jufa from Papua New Guinea. I'm now delighted to introduce live from the great state of Western Australia, uh, the chair of GOPAC Australia, and also the chair in the uh, outgoing uh, parliament. They've just had an election in Western Australia of the uh, Joint Oversight Committee into the Corruption and Crime Commission. Now I'd like to introduce the Honourable Margaret Quirk. Thanks very much, John. Um, greetings to my fellow uh, uh, corruption fighters. And as you've heard, I'm speaking from Perth, uh, the home of the traditional owners, uh, uh, the Wadjuk people of the great Noongar Nation. Uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity um, by making a few observations on the need for parliamentary scrutiny of any anti-corruption regime on behalf of GOPAC uh, Australia. Um, what do we consider as good practice moving forward? Uh, and I'll just briefly give you some background about myself. Um, I'm a member of the West Australian Parliament for the last 20 years. In that time, I've seen the demise of one anti-corruption body and the creation of another, which has operated since 2002. Here is the consensus that it's actually uh, time to redraft the enabling legislation for the current body. So our minds are uh, focused on what an anti-corruption agency should look like in the 21st century. Um, our Corruption and Crime Commission may well have a, a third reincarnation in the not too distant future. Before Parliament, I was Regional Counsel at the National Crime Authority uh, and in that role, we conducted high-level interstate, uh, national and transnational investigations into money laundering, drug importation, official corruption, tax and fraud. Uh, so I'm well aware of the nexus between organised crime and official corruption, um, which was inevitably present uh, in those investigations. I preface my remarks on behalf of... Uh, GOPAC Australia by noting my observations are based on corruption bodies at state, regional and provincial level um, because despite a groundswell of, uh, of a number of years for a federal corruption agency and some outwardly well-publicised, very dubious deals um, uh, worthy of examination in the context of a corruption commission, the creation of such a body has been strenuously resisted uh, at a federal level. There is, however, now at a federal level, a mandatory requirement for bodies corporate to implement and follow a code uh, of conduct for whistleblowers. This is very welcome, and I think it certainly raised awareness in the private as well as public sectors. The other preliminary observation that I make is that in recent years, sustainable development goal uh, 16 has evolved from being an esoteric objective to one which is universally adopted and squarely focused on delivering good and equitable government for all. I want now to focus on the reasons why Parliament and parliamentarians should play a role um, in order that anti-corruption regimes adopted are fully effective and most fully uh, comply with Sustainable Development Goal 16 and regional and international undertakings like the Tayani Wad vision. There seems to be a growing consensus about the components of anti-corruption strategies, how institutions should function, and what are the key indicators of success. There are several reasons why at GOPAC Australia, we believe oversight of anti-corruption commissions by parliament is vital. In practice, such scrutiny does not in any way diminish the independence of an anti-corruption agency. There are a number of reasons. First, we need to ensure that the wide powers conferred on corruption agencies 
are not abused or used for improper purposes. Uh, uh, as I said, they are conferred with wide powers, uh, the capacity to uh, conduct telephone intercepts, lease listening devices, uh, execute covert warrants, use of undercover police. Uh, similarly, the treatment of whistleblowers needs to be handled with the highest probity. The second reason why we think parliamentary scrutiny is important is to guarantee the separation of powers uh, is adhered to, that the executive does not improperly interfere in the work of any anti-corruption agency. Thirdly, um, the participation by parliamentarians in the estimates process ensures that adequate funding of an agency, including indirect interference by the executive in cutting funding. The fourth way in which parliamentarians uh, can um, really value add to any anti-corruption regime is by reviewing and oversighting reports of anti-corruption agencies and more broadly to scrutinise investigative focus of the agency. What allegations are getting priority and what allegations are being ignored? Uh, and often this examination takes the form of hearings which can be both public or private. Fifth, uh, parliamentary oversight injects a level of transparency into what is otherwise a highly secretive uh, operations. This restores the level of public trust in our public institutions. And finally, parliamentary scrutiny uh, ensures that there is a level of expertise among parliamentarians who can then speak with authority when relevant legislation is introduced or policy reforms are debated. And I'd just like to expand on those uh, six points. First, the improper use of powers. In civil society, there is a growing scepticism, even mistrust of governments. The notion of giving an anti-corruption agency unfettered powers does not sit well uh, with many in the community. There's, there have been instances in the past where the mere fact that an individual is the subject of an investigation or is only called to give evidence can ruin a person's reputation for life. This is particularly unjust where no adverse findings are ultimately made, no sanctions imposed, nor prosecutions initiated. To use that well-worn cliche, with power comes great responsibility. It's much more palatable when setting up an anti-corruption body to be able to give assurances that there will be parliamentary scrutiny integrated into the anti-corruption regime. In practice, uh, where in the case of WA, the C has acted inappropriately, a complaint or report will be given to the Parliamentary Oversight Committee. Uh, that committee has two members from the government and two from the opposition. The even numbers of members is to ensure that the committee acts on a consensus basis and is free from the dominance of the ruling party. The committee is free to consider the complaint and report publicly to Parliament or if it does not have access to operational information to the Parliamentary Inspector for the Corruption and Crime Commission. The inspector is a senior lawyer or retired judge who will make inquiries and himself report to Parliament. Such complaints can include misuse or overreach of powers, failure to investigate, delay, improper conduct by C officers and so on. Next to the separation of powers, um, and as you all know, this means the three separate arms of government are to remain independent of one another. The government, the executive, is not to interfere with the judicial um, or the third arm, um, the legislature, in other words, parliament. By defamation, some of the work undertaken by an anti-corruption body is likely to prove embarrassing for governments or individuals within the executive. By having parliamentary scrutiny, the prospect of members of the executive acting improperly, pressuring an agency to ignore the allegations or pursue other matters becomes a riskier proposition. The current allegations in England concerning procurement irregularities worth millions of pounds on um, the acquisition of COVID PPE for the National Health Service are, uh, is a stark example that such corruption 
hurts those most in need and most vulnerable. In this case, once the facts around these dodgy deals became known, it is being pursued through normal parliamentary processes. But these cases are tailor-made uh, for an anti-corruption agency. Um, and as we heard uh, shortly ago, um, the health portfolios, because they are very large, I think are very prone to the risk of corruption. Uh, another way in which parliamentarians can uh, make any anti-corruption regime more robust is the estimates process. Uh, one method that governments restrict the effectiveness of an anti-corruption agency is by cutting budgets. Um, on its face, such a measure could be argued to be part of overall broader austerity measures. However, it can be indirect but a targeted means of limiting a capacity um, of an agency um, charged with investigating corruption to undertake some of its investigations uh, where the government is not desirous uh, of them proceeding. However, in many parliaments, there is the capacity for annual budgets to be uh, closely scrutinised, and these sessions are known as estimates. Hence, if a government tries to thwart the good work of an anti-corruption agency uh, through budget cuts, uh, this may be able to be interrogated through estimates. Parliamentarian scrutiny is very effective in also examining the direction of investigation, what gets priority. And it becomes apparent when an anti-corruption agency tables its report, the nature of their investigation and what it gives priority to. Resources do not in, um, enable it to look at every allegation it receives in detail. How then does an anti-corruption agency decide? This issue has been contentious in Western Australia and from time to time, the Corruption and Crime Commission has been questioned by the Parliamentary Oversight uh, Committee as to its priorities, and that has been done in the public hearing. It's arguable that a secretive, unelected body may not always be in the best position on all occasions to determine that what is in the public interest and uh, what they should devote time to investigate. On the other hand, the Corruption and Crime Commission has undertaken a series of inquiries into procurement probity at various agencies, which has sent shockwaves through the whole public sector. In other words, if the Triple C decides to go on a frolic of its own, ignoring more meritorious matters, it does so in the knowledge that it might invite the criticism of Parliament. And of course, there is also the notion of transparency. If a report of the anti-corruption agency is tabled on Parliament, that may well attract more attention from the media and the public. The contents of the report may also form the subject of the parliamentary debate and parliamentary questions. The more detail with which processes and findings are canvassed, the greater the public confidence in our institutions. A recent practice which the Corruption and Crime Commission has adopted, which I fully approve, is that after 12 months, it will do a follow-up uh, report which addresses how many of its original recommendations uh, were, have in fact been actioned and implemented. This is a powerful tool to ensure that governments act with expedition and to guarantee that the recommendations are taken seriously. And finally, there is the expertise and technical capacity uh, that develops within um, the parliamentary, uh, par within parliamentarians, which I believe is important. Balancing uh, as such anti-corruption agencies, the rights of individuals against providing commission with meaningful and effective powers, enabling laws tend to be detailed and complex. So it's very important um, through a permanent uh, parliamentary committee or oversight mechanism within parliament that there are core parliamentarians who are familiar with the law and the technicalities of how the commission operates. This is very helpful because there tends to be a misunderstanding about processes um, by both the general public, but also with their parliamentary colleagues. Members of the oversight committee have the capacity 
uh, within debate and upon tabling reports to explain the processes, suggest law reforms and exercise leadership. So to conclude, we all acknowledge that the adoption of anti-corruption governance requires leadership and political will. The participation of parliamentarians can have the direct effect of providing peer pressure on decision makers to enact the highest standards of probity across the public sector and by extension, the private sector. Finally, I want to briefly mention a recent case study from this jurisdiction, which starkly illustrates how corruption robs those most in need of basic government services. A pair of senior officials in the housing department manufactured false invoices for work never done and had money paid into account which they had set up. The funds paid into that account were for their personal use and were used in the acquisition of property um, and uh, such as racehorses, uh, palatial houses uh, and the like, and for gambling. The amount of each invoice was below the threshold of $50,000, which avoided the necessity for higher approvals. Unfolding investigations now suggest that this scheme was carried on over almost a decade and netted the perpetrators over $25 million. This was money diverted from providing low-cost housing to the most disadvantaged and vulnerable. The scale of this fraud was extraordinary and has galvanised the government into urgently overhauling its archaic and inconsistent procurement um, policies. So I mentioned this case to say that uh, we need to be constantly vigilant and no one is immune uh, uh, from the tentacles of corruption. And I wish all of you well in your ongoing work. Thank you very much, Honourable Margaret Quirk, uh, for that uh, presentation uh, in the, the realities of what's happening in Western Australia. Look, we've been uh, delighted with all our presentations so far. Um, a number of uh, our members, because their parliament is sitting, or in the case of Samoa, where they've just had their election results and after 35 years of the one government, there is now 25 seats government, 25 seats opposition. So they're a little bit preoccupied with what comes next in Samoa. Uh, but uh, I would invite now, if, if there are any other of our participants who are here live, uh, who would like to make a comment or a question of Margaret, Sonia, uh, who are with us live as well. Um, you're more than welcome uh, to do that. Uh, if you are Zoom, uh, Zoom able, you could raise your hand or just turn on your, your video if you did want to make uh, a comment. Uh, I'll prepare my conclusion now anyway, and then uh, at, at the, oh, actually we might do it now. What we normally do is we get everybody to try and turn on their camera just so we can get a final screenshot of everybody. So today's webinar will be going up on uh, YouTube uh, because a number of people have asked for a link so as they can observe it at a more friendly time for themselves. So I think I shall now ask everybody to turn on their cameras if they'd like to, or of course, if you've told your office you're um, in an important other meeting today, you may not be wanting to be seen on uh, public. Uh, right. Uh, Salamat, uh, not Puggy, Salamat Sore, Ibu Desi. Uh, I don't know if Hugh has got the on button or not. Yes, uh, but... I'm not Puggy here by John. Okay, Thank thanks, very, thanks very much, Desi. 
All right, then. We'll now, through the magic, uh, if we can all smile, we've got a couple of these screenshots taken for posterity. Okay, thank you very much, Terry McCarthy. We'll now, uh, I'll just quickly summarize. Uh, Right, so in conclusion, uh, we've addressed a number of issues today um, and Parliament does have a key role within the SDGs. Uh, goal 16 we've addressed, UNGAS we've, we're now all experts on and an important part out of the last Conference of State Parties was a resolution recognising the role of parliamentarians. Uh, the good practice, uh, the good practices in Papua New Guinea that uh, Gary Jufa addressed and that uh, quite pivotal health inquiry report, which is one of the most comprehensive reports that any of the Pacific Island country parliaments have undertaken. Uh, next. Uh, and we will be making available that report. Now, what I did want to quickly address is from our, some of our colleagues in Vanuatu. A big issue in the Pacific has been constituency development funds, which are often allocated uh, off budget. So they don't have the same transparency. And so what we've now had is uh, a small number of MPs who are publicly reporting on exactly how they've spent their money. So in some countries, it's up to a million dollars that each member of parliament is given to disperse in their own country. And this is a, a, an excellent practice that's begun in Vanuatu. Thank you. So finally, on behalf of GOPAC Oceania, uh, and uh, my colleagues uh, at the UN Pacific Regional Anti-Corruption Project. Uh, we've been working together since 2013. Uh, some old pictures there in 2015 when uh, Sonia's predecessor, the excellent uh, Michaela, who's gone on to be working with UNDP in Georgia, uh, was involved with us. The former, the late Prime Minister of Tonga, as well. But we're delighted that you have taken time out of your busy schedules today to join us and we'll certainly be in touch with the link to the recording of today's uh, webinar and also during the 2nd to the 4th of June, GOPAC and UNPRAC will be working together to present the GOPAC uh, Parliamentarians uh, International Session from New York. So thank you once again and best wishes in everybody's efforts against corruption throughout the Pacific. Thank you, Marlo. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, have a good day. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.